<laughs> hey folks, welcome to the Pain Door Podcast. This is your host, Dr. Kevin, and my co-host, Dr. Melissa Katie. And Melissa, it is always great to talk to you. How are you today? Excellent. Excited for our first episode, of course. The, the first episode, and with like any first episode, there's always debate on what we should be talking about and what and how do we want this podcast to go. Um, and let's talk about that really briefly is what do you think what is our goals for this podcast? What do we want that the viewers and listeners to this podcast get out of it? Well, I think uh, as humans, we have all endured some form of pain and it doesn't have to be the kind of pain that a lot of people think of. People try to divide it into physical pain, emotional pain, all kinds of pain, but there's always something in life that relates to some discomfort or pain or challenge or stress and there's just so many ways that we can twist this and talk about it and enlighten people's perspectives uh, based on just our, our own experience and the extra training and education we've been going through, especially coming out of our traditional um, training into this <laughs> more enlightened version of our understanding of pain and stress and challenges in life. So, you know, maybe we should let people know a little bit about us and, and why we're even doing this together. I like that because um, we definitely have the background to tell you what not to do, right? <laughs> we, I mean, uh, so so just to begin with, uh, I am a fellowship trained pain specialist at my medical school in Chicago, did a fellowship in Michigan, uh, was associate program director of the Naval Medical Center of San Diego Pain Fellowship Program, which I always like to say what I'm speaking or teaching or working with individuals that's... Uh, I learned everything that we do in the healthcare system and I taught other docs and fellows and residents how to do it. And it wasn't until I started questioning my own understanding of pain and started looking at the research and re-examining the outcomes data that I realized that we basically couldn't have designed a worse treatment for the, for the treatment of pain. And through that health than what we have in our quote unquote healthcare system, which is really more of a sick care system where we manage and in some situations make things worse rather than actually help people get better and promote health and healthy lifestyle and active living. So that's that's my background interest. And I know you have some commonalities there as well. Oh, no, absolutely. Well, you know, that whole thing about sick care, that could probably be a good podcast in the future. But, um, you know, so I went into medical school, uh, osteopathic medical school, um, just like you, and uh, did my training. Um, came out and liked a lot of things and did a year of general surgery, a year of internal medicine and three years of anesthesiology and then a one year pain medicine fellowship. And, you know, I ended up enduring pain myself. You just kind of just keep plugging along. You don't sit there and think about it. You're kind of forced to keep, you know, running the hamster wheel when you're in medical training. And um, ironically in medical school, when I started having, you know, back pain issues, um, and that story I can dive into in a little bit, but I got out of my pain medicine fellowship, spent a couple days subbing for, I guess it'd be easier to say subbing, but filling in for another position. <laughs> substitute um, teacher. Yeah, no, like <laughs> substitute it. poker. My, my mom was a substitute teacher. So, you know, that, that's <laughs> probably why I use that term. Um, people understand it. But, you know, so I ended up filling in and I, I filled out, I think, probably over 50 prescriptions of opioids each day and had about four or five physician assistant or um, nurse practitioners that were doing a lot of the heavy load of seeing patients for the physician there. That was their typical protocol. And I just thought, to heck with this. I, I'm not going to be just dishing out these drugs, not understanding the patient, not knowing them, not knowing the whole story. It was a slippery slope in my eyes because I knew from my own pain journey that there was a lot of things I did now, I didn't understand why they necessarily helped, but I wasn't using the injections, the medications or the surgeries, and I was getting better and I was finding ways to help myself. And so I felt really nauseated uh, to be intuitively my gut. It just felt like I couldn't be part of this. And so from the very beginning, I just decided I'm not going to be a traditional pain medicine physician. I have some really wonderful friends that do it, and uh, they do struggle with the system and trying to create good care that's holistic in nature and not always resorting to these interventions. So hence, I uh, wrote my book, Pandemic, then created my Pain Out Loud website and interviewing people all over the world and finding other ways of helping people with pain. And so in that journey, I met you and um, we have 
voiced our, our, our changes in perception and, and just the realizations that the way this is constructed, um, not pain itself, construction, but the construction of the medical system that tries to help people with pain is not really serving them. And so I think we both have a, a really strong, deep passion um, for education. And we realize that it's really, really hard to sell in a way, and I don't mean by in monetary ways, but to have people buy into the idea that they need to learn about pain to overcome their pain or to master their pain. And so I think um, we're just trying to do something together to really help people see things differently. You know, I think, uh, and as we, we had discussed about briefly, is this is, this is gonna start with pain and we'll be talking a lot about pain, but to think that this is only about pain, we'd be doing a disservice. And I think you as a listener would be doing a disservice because uh, good healthcare starts with good pain care. Um, what's interesting, Melissa, is you, you started with the drugs, you know, you, you found all these opioid prescriptions. And um, my background is a little bit different because through fellowship, we were not, we were pretty, um, I would say ahead of the curve when it came to opioids. Um, which is sort of frankly shocking because people, you know, in, in some circles, I'm thinking, seeing this total anti-opioid guy and I'm not an anti-opioid guy. I'm an anti do things for not understanding them guy. And um, I actually did research when I was in residency on opioids with our hypothesis being, because this was widely reported at that time, that chronic pain was, if you actually had chronic pain, it was protective against addiction, that you couldn't get addicted if you were taking opioids for chronic pain. And the study that we were using was one rat study um, that my mentor said, hey, look at this and maybe we can do a review article on it. Out of Japan, I spent three months diving through the literature there and it was absolutely shocking. I think that was the first start when I started just questioning the opioid part. Um, we pulled some, pulled some, this was pre Google guys, like or in the, Google was super new. So like trying to find pap papers and stuff was not like how easy it is now. And we pulled up one that had been widely quoted and pushed out on, on this, it's kind of notorious known as Porter and Jack. It's literally one paragraph long. My mentor took one look at it and goes, we cannot use that, that's garbage. <laughs> and, I mean, because this, I mean, he, he's, he's an amazing individual, one of the top opioid researchers actually in the world and um, just, a, just a fun, fun wonderful guy and, and really taught me a lot about like looking at the data. But uh, I just started, that was where I started looking at it. It's like all this crap about opioids is, is just lies, like it's absolutely lies. But from the procedural part, so then I was on the high interventional aim, aim or side. And when I was in the military, you know, we did not get paid to do injections. We could have never done an injection if we didn't want to. We got paid exactly the same. We did injections because we believed in them. And there were six other fellowship trained pain specialists. And we were, some of us were conservative and some of my colleagues were a lot more aggressive, but we did them because we believed in them. But I'll never forget, like one of my other really good friends in the military, he's like, Sometimes I have no clue what the hell we're doing because this doesn't make any sense. And these questions start, you know, you start once you get these little these little seeds in your brain, you're like, well, this doesn't seem to make sense. Why can you do an injection, same injection, same on two different people for the same quote unquote reason and have 180 degree opposite outcomes? It, it makes absolutely no sense. How could you do an injection? Now, this is, you know, if you've ever had an injection and then you come back and you say, well, this is exactly the same and you have the exact same injection and you have a completely different outcome. That does not make sense. It's like if you had a bacterial infection and you took an antibiotic and you got better and then you came in with the same bacteria, you would take the same antibiotic and you'd expect the same results. Because that's the way, and if you don't, it's because something is different. Something, you have different bugs, there's resistance, all this other stuff. So, so the whole practice of pain didn't make any sense. And like you, um, I thought it was, where I shot, thought it was the model. So I was practicing this military. I left the military, joined, um, went into civilian practice. And within six to eight months, I was like, this is no different. This is still makes absolutely no sense. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we like to pretend like, I always I like to say all physicians are arrogant. We it's just sort of in the nature or whatever. <laughs> but um, you know, as I saw what was happening in the communities, like and the, the, you, there is crazy stuff. Like you would not believe. Like I'm not. I'm anti-intervention. Period. Like I don't believe if you're doing injections for the treatment of persistent pain, then you don't understand pain. Period. That's just the way it is in my book. But there's people out there that are doing 
like you just can't believe what they're doing. It is, it's nuts. Like, yeah. oh, wow. It's yeah. just, it's just crazy. And these are doctors, by the way, these are doctors and, and healthcare providers that are doing things that are so outside, even the baseline model of what care is in a crap care system. Like we have this crappy set of guidelines that people sort of agree is true. And these, there's people out there doing stuff that you, you just can't even, you just can't even believe what they're doing to people. So yeah, it's crazy. Yeah. There's, there's way more. I mean, there's no doubt. Um, there's no doubt that there are, I mean, I don't even need, I don't even need data at this point for me to know that there are way more injections, medications and surgeries going on than need to be period. Like I, it's, it's been happening for so long and we see it around us and it's hard to, you know, when you see a patient in front of you, since I do some, you know, occasional anesthesia work myself right now, and you see them in front of you and they, you know, they're getting certain things done to them. It's like trying to make them to tell them that they're wrong in front of their face without establishing a relationship and a rapport and a trust. It just backfires in your face because there's so much belief in the way the system has been designed. And of course, in many cases, they see the surgeon as up here way above me. Um, you know, sometimes I'm considered a nurse and, and no offense to great nurses. It's just, you know, they don't even conceptually understand that I'm an anesthesiologist. I'm a physician. <laughs> um, so there's just so trained physician too. Yeah, so as, as trained a physician too. with additional training on top of that stuff an expert in their field. Right. Yeah. yeah. And that, and then that is a, um, so I, I, I've been doing, well, I was doing hundred percent pain. So I got out of the OR after the military, but that also presents some very ethical quandaries mm -hmm. when you're in that scenario. You feel complicit. You, you, not only do you feel complicit in what's being done, but then you have a person who is in a very vulnerable state. Mm -hmm. And um, what it, it, it is, it's, that's a very difficult path to navigate. And uh, I, I don't, I don't know how you do it. <laughs> because I, I, it, I, it, it, it is that I think is way harder. And it's just me for easy for easier for me is just to stay out of it. Just so, yeah. you know, try to get in front of people as much as you can. Cause you, that's a, that's a, that's almost a lose lose scenario right there. Cause right. you try to do what's best for the patient. Not only will you now have, um, well, I actually, I don't care about the surgeon. They can, you know, they're doing this stuff. You know, I don't care about them. But but the it's the patient in front of you that now you put actually an extra layer of stress on something yeah. um, that can be quite difficult. So yeah, no, it's 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 crazy. And that actually leads up to what we what we were hoping to discuss today right. is well, surgery in pain. Yes. So well, it, and the fascinating thing is that this other layer of complexity you just talked about is that the mere the mere thought or the action of doing surgery on someone who has pain and no good real functional reason, you know, beyond that, it literally is just for pain. You could create more pain from surgery itself and people oh. don't recognize that you can create more chronic or worse situations. Well, not only can you worsen pain or expand it or enlarge it, but you can have some catastrophic other effects with this stuff. Mm -hmm. And that's and death, know, <laughs> death it, it being being the kind of the penultimate uh, complication with with these therapies. And so, anytime that you're looking at, you know, again, we're going to talk a little bit more about surgery specifically. But if you look at like the spectrum of what physicians in particular we can do, so modern healthcare is built around, you know, not talking rehab and things like that. But if you're going in and seeing your doctor, there's like four things that we can do to you. Like I say, you can look at you. That means we can do x-rays, MRIs, some side of imaging technique. We can order lab work to kind of look at what the basic biological functions are. We can cut you, which means that we can do surgery. If we don't personally do it, we'd send you to a colleague or refer you to a colleague who does it. We can poke you, which means we can stick needles in you and do injections or have somebody else do them. Or we can drug you. We can write a prescription. But those are like the four things that we can actually do to anyone. Mm -hmm. And when you're looking at at, at pain specifically and pain that has been there for months and months and months that stuff doesn't work and not only does it not work every all of those things have side effects 
drugs you have side effects because every every drug that we take works on a, on a receptor so if it's working on you as still a, instead of killing a bacteria it's working on an endogenous a natural receptor in your body just like anything if you stick a bunch of extra stuff in there you're now altering your normal physiology now you have side effects we have overdose risk we have um there's there is risks of addiction and abuse issues with these things. We have um, effects on your brain where you can't think clearly anymore. We start slurring speech. I mean, there are actually been case reports of people who have been admitted into nursing homes. And the problem wasn't because that they had dementia, but they mm -hmm. were on 14 medications mm -hmm. and they looked demented. And when you had someone in there finally take a second look and start peeling off these drugs, these people can leave because all of a sudden they woke up again. So there's side effects with everything. The problem with surgery, though, is these side effects can be catastrophic in the in the short course. So you have death, you have paralysis, you have loss of limb, you have infections throughout your body. Um, you can have end organ failure. I mean, this is this, in. And when you're doing surgery for quote unquote pain, like well, that's what you were, you were saying is when pain is the primary indication to have the surgery, mm -hmm. not pain associated with something. Right. But pain is the only reason that you're doing it. And then they will say degenerative disc and all this other garbage, but <laughs> pain is the reason. It's crazy. It is, yeah. it is absolutely insane. Yeah. And, and obviously I can't reveal a lot of details, but I can't tell you how many times I've come across middle-aged individuals, some who've never had surgery before and have had three months of pain and strictly back pain. No, no particular pain down the leg, no particular functional deficits, meaning like they're not like dragging their leg along the floor and it's getting significantly worse. Um, and obviously, you know, not making any progress, uh, despite some conservative, maybe some conservative approaches, because some people can have some slight functional changes that might improve. But the point is, is that I've come across plenty of people that have isolated back pain and never had any conservative management whatsoever. And they are getting two and three level fusions that make absolutely no sense. And I guess this would be a good um, segue into I'm going to if it's okay, I'm going to go ahead and share the because I just got it in the mail. Absolutely, yeah, absolutely. That's the reason <laughs> I, we're on today. I, I'm sure Dr. Hanscom wouldn't mind, but David <laughs> Hanscom is a complex spine surgeon, uh, orthopedic spine surgeon, who um, actually is a, a fascinating story and has really committed himself to trying to change the industry and and how medicine's being practiced. But the title, which it's probably backwards on here. No, oh, it shows. I can see it. Okay. It looks on my screen. You really need spine surgery is so perfect. And um, there is a page on the first page of chapter five, which I think is like page 53. Um, for physicians or people who are dealing with pain, it's a very interesting approach when you try to categorize all the various things that you're, you know, not only are we talking about, we were just talking about back pain that's isolated, um, but there's structural and non-structural reasons that sometimes people try to pursue surgery, whether it's right or not. But there's also other components related to the nervous system. I'll let you dive into this, uh, um, Kevin, if you want. But um, calm, stressed is some other columns. And it seems like that's so unrelated to people that are, you know, they're having pain. They want to blame something. Well, and it, yeah, that's where they go to surgery thinking it's the thing. But what would you say about that? Well, I, I well, there's a reason that, you know, we love our brains want to perceive information in cause and effects fashion. That's the way they're designed. Yeah. And so we want to do that. And when you're in pain, it's always, oh, what's the cause? What's the cause? And that's like the number one flaw. Right. It keeps that keeps you alive. That keep if it's a survival based mechanism. Um, it's like if you step on a nail, it's like, well, what's the cause? Well, it's the cause of the nail. Well, actually, the cause isn't. The nail, the, the nail is associated with the pain, but the pain doesn't, it's, there's no pain pus oozing from the nail up through your foot. Um, but that's a survival thing. It may, it's easier to think that way, right? The, um, and that works for kind of basic things sometimes, maybe the majority of the time, but not all the time, but right. it's a good, good enough to keep us alive. Um, the, when you start looking at long-term though, when there's so many other contributors that are involved in how we would say constructing pain. So instead of seeing a pain as like it flows like water, or oozes like pain pus, where we poke it and all the little pain pus oozes out of it, 
it's much easier to think of pain in a fire fashion that is constructed, that you have to have fuel, then you have to have oxygen and heat. And each of those components come together in order to construct an experience of pain. And if you can start visualizing pain in that way, and that's a whole nother episode, um, that changes the game. And from a physician standpoint, it changes how you manage. But what's interesting about that surgical grid is he's kind of taking this complexity and he simplified it in such a way that is beautifully elegant because you don't have to have this long discussion about pain anymore. All you have to start looking at is about is where you are in this grid. And um, you may say, the way to think about it is if you have a broken leg, but you are all stressed out, you are losing your house, you're going through a divorce, your kids are doing drugs. Um, I don't know, you, you've been, you've got abuse in the family or whatever. Yeah. You would want the leg to be, you know, let's put a cast, let's put it, something on the leg. But you don't ignore all those other things. Right? If you are in an abusive house and someone's at risk and they're going to be thrown out on the street, in an ideal world, we could at least understand and see those contributors. But we'd still work on the leg, not ignoring those. It's not like, well, I'm sorry, you're not going to have a house. We're just going to put this cast on. Actually, I guess our healthcare system kind of does that a lot. But in an ideal world, you wouldn't do it. Yeah. But the, when it comes to the pain, now, now say you have leg pain, same leg pain, but now you don't have a broken bone. But now you have all these other things are still there. Your abusive relationship, kids are doing drugs. Uh, you're on, you're going to lose your, all these outside stressors that people are saying, you, you know, it's always remarkable. People list all these stressors. And then as soon as you start saying, well, is, do you think that's related? Oh, no, this has nothing to do with my pain. I'm like, well, that's interesting because if it was me, I'd have everything to do with my pain. Yeah. But in that scenario, and you would look at, again, like that fire. Now we have something. We don't have a lot of fuel because we don't have the broken bone. We have all this heat and oxygen in there. Well, then maybe we should start targeting the heat and oxygen. And what's very interesting and what isn't commonly noticed, you start doing that and people can get better without having the surgery done. And so what that grid allows you to do is say, well, is there a broken leg problem or is there not a broken leg problem? And is there lots of crazy stress in your life? And they're not, again, they're not independent variables. They're related because if you have that broken leg and all that distress, yeah, maybe we'll do maybe we'll do the surgery plus we're going to look at those other things. But if you don't have the broken leg, we shouldn't chop your leg off just because you have leg pain. Right. When we do that with sur with back surgery specifically. And so that 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 surgical grid I think is beautifully elegant. Now just one thing I want to say about this book though. I think this is one of the most important books in that have been written in healthcare recently. Because we have books that have talked about overutilization in healthcare. We have books that talk about how the healthcare system is not a healthcare system, it's a sick care system. But what this one does is a complex spine surgeon. Dave Hanscom is one of the top surgeons in the world. I mean, the, the guy is like, like you can see how he was such a, a, an amazing surgeon. He's like a machine, <laughs> but in a good way. But um, calling out his colleagues. And, what, and when I find in medicine, is not and we people dance on the sidelines and I did it for years. You dance on the sidelines and you don't want to upset anybody and you make all this stuff. But at some point you have to basically say this is wrong, and I and and you need to call it out and to have a complex spine surgeon that quite honestly and anybody tries to attack Dave's credentials and they're going to go nowhere because he was literally the guy that the spine surgeons would send the toughest patients to because they couldn't do them. He had to do them, yep. and uh, and he's the one out there saying. They're, we're doing way too much of this stuff. And he was the one you know, seeing two to three patients a week that had the look in the original imaging and they should never have had an operation. And now their spines are crumbling and they literally can't walk. They're in wheelchairs and they have to figure out what they're going to do now. So I, I, I do think this is an incredibly important book and particularly from a healthcare standpoint, if anyone, anyone is thinking about having a surgery on their back and they walked into that office and they walked out of that office they need to read this book before they even think about scheduling that operation. I mean, it, it, it is that simple. Yep. Yeah. I'm giving you a nice close up. <laughs> we, if if uh, we could put a link to, to the book online when we have it on uh, our video format, but, um, or in the show notes, but there, there's, there's no way that I would, I mean, that when you talk about his, credentials and his experience and his heart and what he's truly trying to do. Um, it would, if you know that this book is out there, it would be, um, it would be a real shame 
and um, a disservice to yourself. And if you know of anyone that's going to be thinking about having spine surgery, you should give them some level of, you know, um, you know, perspective and have make sure that they get their hands on this book because this is going to be, um, yeah, it's really going. It's going to open a lot of people's eyes, I think. I, I think so. And at least it provides a tool because the other part about that is you feel so helpless a lot of times when you hear about friends or family members that are thinking about doing this kind of stuff. And if you have medical background, you may try to, you know, you may try to quote the stats. You may talk about the research. Um, but for whatever reason, that becomes very difficult for people to stomach or to believe in. And it's even worse if it's you, because if right. it's a friend or family member, nobody wants to listen to their friends or family members. You could be the top expert in the world. You're still, you know, a friend or family member. So it means you know nothing about, you know, the, your opinion isn't an expert, but having a physical book written by a complex spine surgeon that quotes the data and research, that is a, that's a different argument. Um, and some people, and the other nice thing about that, it gives people an opportunity to consume it at their own pace. So right. they may pick up the book and if they're if and if they're really like concerned and thinking about it like they should be uh, at some point, you don't know when they may pick it up and start reading it. And who knows what will happen? Who knows what will happen to them? That's it's just an opportunity for you to actually provide a little, uh, you know, a little nudge and say, hey, maybe maybe this is something you need to look at and, and maybe you can change someone's life with that. So I do think this is I, I do. I really think this is this is one of the most important books that have been written when it comes to health and healthcare and specifically pain and, and back surgery. Right. And for the record, um, I know I'm not, and I'm sure you're not getting paid for saying all this. We're merely. But maybe we should be. We go find someone to sponsor us. <laughs> if you have a sponsor out there that want to sponsor us, too, we can try to keep people off of procedures. We like anti sponsors. You know, <laughs> there's no one's going to pay. You know, no but, one's going to. David, David Hanscom's not paying us to say this about his book, is all. Oh, I'm no, doing. but he should. He yeah. Should. <laughs> If you want us to promote our message, <laughs> yeah, I want to rewind about it because if you know, if you go back to uh, um, one of the things we were talking about is how aggressive spine surgery is, like, and just how, what's happening in this world. And one of the things that you can do when you're looking at healthcare, this is sort of like a, a little trick for people in the audience. If you want to know where where people are doing stuff that's inappropriate medicine, look where private equity is investing. <laughs> and what I mean by that is these big old hedge funds go out and buy medical groups and practices. And right now they're buying dermatology practices. They're buying imaging centers, like places that have MRIs. They're buying the quote unquote spine centers that are doing these injections. Mm -hmm. um, the, the reason they do that is not because they're good people. It's because they make a lot of money. And so, and they have known that if you invest in these places, you can make a lot of money and who cares how you make it. It's just pump people through and their quote unquote growth market. So yeah, and it's, it just cracks me up that this is, it's just where, 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 where does the money flow in, uh, in spine and, and pain, the procedural aspect of it is where the money's flowing. It's a little bit, it's less than it was 10 years ago, but it's still a huge money maker. Yeah. And I've been into some other States lately and even like specifically one institution is strictly centered around neurosurgeons or, orthopedic or both. Yeah. They're, they're literally creating these, these like Taj Mahals of places that are, they're being funded by the neurosurgeons and orthopedic surgeons. All the procedures are doing all, all the procedures. Oh, I forgot. The other one was interventional cardiology. That's not equal offender there. Let's not leave them out. Um, uh, chest pain, pain. <laughs> yeah. Car that's chest pain. Yeah. Chest pain. Right. But um, I mean, it's just absolutely brutal what's happening out there so um yeah, yeah so if you're if if if, <laughs> if if you're concerned about it you just got to look where the money's flowing and and how many you know like, ah, well, there. and i think you know i think this all i really think that there's a part of um humans sometimes underestimate or take for granted the bodies we have and they um and not to accuse everyone, I'm just saying as a general rule, we're busy, stressed, and we just don't have time. We're not being patient. And sometimes we don't really appreciate the brilliance and resilience of the human body. And um, I will tell you that there are plenty of times that I've had pain myself that I think to myself, if I wasn't who I was and know what I know, 
would I go and get help? And I would probably say, yeah, most people would go in. And there's nothing wrong with that if you have a lot of uncertainty. The question is who you're going to and what their what their drivers are um, and the system they work in. But there's a lot of things that people don't understand why I don't go in when I know that I strain my knee, it's still functional. It's just, you know, I say it's mad at me right now, you know, whatever. Um, I have ways of just like, okay, it just needs time. Just give it time. It'll be fine. And, um, but for a lot of people, um, it's hard for them to believe it can get better. They think they've already made a mess of it and it's done and they got to fix it. And I don't ever think I, not always, but most of the time I just know that it just needs time. Well, the, the, the brain and body are remarkably resilient mm -hmm. things like this, like you talked, talked about and they're, um, it is amazing the healing capacity of the body. And this doesn't, I'm, I'm not saying we were whatever the body is designed to heal and keep itself alive. I mean, it is, it, it is amazing. And I, and this idea, I've, I've been trying to figure this out. I've been doing a lot of thought about that over probably the last year is how the hell have we diseasified the body so much to make it seem like it's just so pathetic and weak and, and it's brittle. Uh, and, and again, so this is where we're, you know, maybe through, as we do more episodes, this really pain care is the foundation of good healthcare because then you look at back pain, and there's this belief that the back is this brittle structure, like it is so you can sneeze and you'll become paralyzed is so weak and pathetic. Mm -hmm. And it is one of the strongest structures in the body. I mean, if you look at what's vital to you for living in existence, it's like this thing. And so what do we do? We can case the brain in this freaking box, like a treasure chest, this thing, the heart and lungs, and we put a cage around them. And the other one, which is like the terminal for information and keep you moving is your spine, is the is your uh, is your spinal cord and the nerves. And it, that is designed and it is protected by one of the most resilient structures out there to allow you to move and bend at the same time to protect you. It has all these what we call redundancy. I think that's the engineering term where mm -hmm. if this happens then this will kick in. If this, ha you know, the secondary backup and the third day backup and, and it's just remarkably strong. And yet we have taught people this expectation and probably some of it comes from direct to consumer advertising. Cause now, you know, direct to consumer advertising started in 1998. We're only two nations do it, us in New Zealand and pharma is just permeating with us with these symptoms that are, most of them are normal biological symptoms and telling them they're wrong. And we, and people just believe that they're weak. And then, you know, I think the risk is nobody ever wants to say, well, you, you're okay. And then have something bad happen. Right. Right. We're so medically, everybody's all, well, just see your doctor, just see your doctor. So we default to that. Yeah. But realistically, you're at more at risk of over intervention than something bad happening if you're not going in 90% of the time. So it really is the thing you're sitting, what's the 90% versus the 10 or actually it's probably five or four or 3%. You know, how do you distinguish that? And it really comes down to being appreciative of the body, having confidence in your ability to heal. And if you do go in because I think that's the roughest thing is people, you know, you know, having a medical background is just like, I'm just terrified. Like if I didn't have my medical background, I wouldn't know what to do for everybody else though, with who ha doesn't have a medical background, you got to approach healthcare like this as a raging river and you're thirsty. Like you're, so you go up and you have a little cup and you get your water and, and you drink until you're, you're no longer thirsty anymore. But if you jump into that raging river, thinking that you're going to get your drink or you carry this big bucket and try to get it, it's going to pull you in. And that river is going to, it's going to bounce you off of rocks, take you over waterfalls. And, and you're lucky if you can pull you out. I mean, it, the, the dangers of over intervention and over utilization in healthcare are just, I just don't think that people understand how great those risks are for many of these conditions. Um, if you see, you know, if you if just see someone who, who is aggressive, like that's the, right. If you have a good primary care doc who can who knows when you need chicken soup and when you need to go home and watch you know eat some chicken soup and watch movies and let your body recover versus when you need aggressive stuff and there's and if they do this is what you want them to say hey you're going to be okay everything's going to be fine it's just going to take some time it shouldn't be well i need some drugs or i need this or how could you say that it, it should be okay that that's what you should be seeking to hear when you go into the office um right uh, yeah, and then the, the problem with healthcare and high deductibles provides a different aspect. Because if you walk in and you're paying, you know, eleven hundred dollars a month in a premium, you have a forty dollar copay and a six thousand dollar deductible, and then you walk in and the doctor says, "Hey, you're going to be okay. You just need some time." You're going to get pissed. 
because yeah. you just think of all that money and, and it's just kind of being able to think that <laughs> it really yeah. don't want to do something to you. Right. And it's, and it's kind of like what we do, the people in the medical field, we bounce things off each other for even our own things. And we have that benefit. And that's the beauty of kind of being in the industry, so to speak, or the profession, I should say. Um, but there's that delicate balance between, okay, you kind of want the reassurance. If there's something you need to rule out something serious, then, you know, then that's kind of where it's your best served. If it's just something you just make sure if it seems reasonable, not always. Um, but then there's always that you don't want to be overly vigilant and worrying all the time. If you think that, you know, it is okay, everything's been reassured, but there's always that possibility something else could emerge that would change the scenario. And so it's like, you just want to be mindful and paying attention to you and your body and be educated by your professional. So if they do reassure you, it's more like, okay, if, if something changed, like what are the things I should look for uh, without being overly stressed out about it so that you are always, it's like anything you, you kind of reassess the situation from time to time. And yeah. That's the best way to approach your health, I think. But no, I I, I totally agree. And and in, in the vast majority of time, tincture of time solves almost everything. Yeah. And um, I I can't remember where I read this, but I just absolutely loved it because when it comes to like health, batter gets batter, right? And so um, if you're waiting with time and things get worse, that is usually the time that you start really starting getting checked out. Now, not all, not some situations you can, the, the badness, it's evaluating what the badness is. Right. Um, but but it, it's astonishing to me, with a, particularly with pain, is to see people who are getting better, not badder, yeah. and then be recommended for surgery. I have a personal uh, mm -hmm. story. This was, this was, a, this was the, the brother of a friend of mine, and it just, I'm actually ashamed that this even happened, but um, they ended up with a two level fusion. Mm -hmm. I think they had an episode of back pain. They had a prior surgery. There was a bunch of other stuff, um, a bunch of other stuff in the, in the picture, but they had an acute episode of back pain. Um, talked to their, their family member, their family member gave them some re recommendations. Um, I was really concerned about having surgery, started walking, uh, saw their primary care doc though. And their primary care doc probably did about everything wrong. And I, and I'm not picking on primary care, by the way. Um, I, 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 I think primary care is one of the most important specialties that we have. I think we, you know, only 40, 51% of healthcare is delivered by primary care. It should be 90%. If they had the time to spend with their patients, they could do a fantastic job because they're generally don't have all these motivators and they see the big picture of stuff. But in this scenario, whoever this person was, did everything what they shouldn't have done, ordered an MRI off the back, you know, saw some age related change and referred him to a spine surgeon. Mm -hmm. Now, when he saw the spine surgeon, he was walking three miles a day. Mm. His back pain was getting better. And the surgeon it walked into the room and said, you need a fusion. Mm -hmm. He got a second opinion and kind of, but once you, once you plant that kind of thing in there and you're not, you're not medically trained and you have this person with the white coat and doing all this stuff, you know, Oh my God, this is a big surgeon. It is really hard to get that, that, that fear away because someone said, you now need surgery. And then every twinge and every time your pain flares up, you're thinking I need surgery and surgery. And ultimately he ended up with a fusion. And not only that, he got stuck on the opioids. Mm. And became to the point where his family had to end of intervention. He went through rehab. I think he went through inpatient rehab to come off those medications. And now is actively speaking about the danger of those opioids. And um, you would never, ever, ever have thought that that could, could have happened to this guy. Yeah. It happens all the time. That's the sad thing. And, you know, to add to a different element, not just back, um, but an example without uh, details, uh, just a general story is that a 60s to 70s year old man <clears throat> was, and I'm the person that was supposed to do the anesthesia, uh, I was supposed to get a shoulder reconstruction. And um, ironically, what happened, probably hopefully to his benefit, I don't know what happened in the long run, but I was noticing that the previous time this person had been there, they ran, their heart rate ran in the fifties or sixties. And it was suddenly like 140s and they were at rest. And I was like, okay, I'm going to run an EKG. Something doesn't seem right. Um, I called the surgeon. 
And I just said, you know, I'm, I'm kind of worried about, oh, actually, right before I called the surgeon, I asked a few other important questions. I said, because I always want to know the urgency of the surgery. Mm -hmm. It was an elective case for shoulder pain. And I said, are you having pain right now? No. So he scheduled this two or three months before. Talk about patience. Um, and I asked him, are you having a limitation of your movement of your shoulder? And I said, can you move your shoulder this way and that way? Full range of motion, no pain. And I called the surgeon, which was, gave me the strength to call the surgeon to be like, I think we should deal with the heart first. It's kind of important. Um, and I don't want anything bad to happen in my hands when it doesn't seem necessary, especially this. The wife in the corner of the room proceeds to tell me before the surgeon shows up, because I mentioned it, we might not do the surgery. I don't mm -hmm. think wise. She's like, well, he was, he was in so much pain and he's got this terrible rotator cuff tear. And I was like, and I'm trying to be like, play diplomacy here and just say, well, he's not having pain now and he has full range of motion and his heart is not behaving normally right now. And, but you can see the conviction in her eyes that it's torn. It's got to be fixed. Yet she doesn't realize that 20% or more people that have no pain in their lives and their shoulders can have the same tears. And, and you're trying to battle this conviction from the surgeon. And if, the whole point is if you go see a surgeon and you may not need it, and it's hard to prove to people sometimes until you like force themselves not to like do the surgery. Mm -hmm. The if, if the surgeon schedules you right away, and I know a relative that thinks that they're just awesome surgeons, they want to help them with pain and get them on the schedule sooner. You realize <laughs> that they're taking advantage of the fact that your pain exists mm -hmm. right now and that you don't believe it could get better without them. <laughs> Well, or worse than that, so this is in the interventional pain land. I was actually told this by a interventional colleague about how in his practice, they when they got a call from the primary care with somebody with an acute, acute radicular pain, so the pain shooting down their leg or arm, they wanted to get them, they said, have those send to our office as soon as possible. The next words out of his mouth were, because we know, this is what he was telling me, because we know they're going to get better, but if I do the injection, they'll think it was me. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because yes, most people with radicular pain will get better without any intervention. But right. if I've now done something to you, whether I poke you, pop you, or pill you, and now it, now you believe it was me, if that flares again or happens again or whatever, who are you going to think is responsible or who do you think is the one who's in control of your pain? Me. That's great for practice building. It's crappy for your, for, for your health, your personal health. Yeah. Um, I mean, it's just, it's, it's astounding. Right. And I think we should have a conversation in the future, um, you know, about self-efficacy, meaning, you know, that the patient recognizes they have the capacity and the ability to help themselves. Um, yeah, I've that multiple times had sciatica and I've done various little maneuvers to help myself and it's great. Well, and, and, and uh, that would be actually be a, a really good discussion that we can have is because when you start looking about, I call about in control, you know, there's a circle of control, there's the internal circle, what do you control inside? And there's external control of everything that else outside the circle that, you know, anything outside of your circle you don't control. And what you really want to do is make sure that you're staying when your health comes into in your circle of control. What can I do? Who can I work with? What can I learn? Because that's not only sustainable, but it actually has the side effects are, are beneficial. You'll find that the same things that you can do for quote unquote pain will actually help things like distress or relationships or family or overall health or even heart conditions or your GI health and all this other stuff. Yeah. Um, but what we are what we tend to do in the healthcare system and the TV commercials and everything else don't help this is we try to pull away your control and externalize it. So anytime someone says that you need me and it has to do about your health, the first thing that you should be doing is what can I do so that you're pulling the back of that control for many, many, many different reasons. But the, probably the biggest one is because that's also the cheapest way for you. I mean, it, it, you don't now, if you can do it and you learn how to do it, you don't need to see someone every week or two weeks or go through this. And, you know, when it flares, go, I need to go see Dr. So-and-so so they can do all this stuff. It's like, that's expensive. <laughs> It's like right. super expensive, yeah. has lots of side effects and is unnecessary. Right. So. 
Yeah. And I have to just on some of the final notes here is we want to get people to a place where they utilize the least risk with the cheapest route. And that will not make the medical system money. And I know that there's a lot of people that, um, and I'm not anti, um, you know, I'm not anti intervention a hundred percent. Um, I think there's a small sliver if they're educated in the right way, but that's really kind of still confounds the picture. Um, I, I recognize that. And I say that only because I don't want people think that I'm shaming them. And neither one of us, I think, want to feel, we don't want to make people feel like they're being shamed because they've already done something. They didn't have the education to know that there may have been a better way. Um, but I have to make a point that we can talk about later is that I know that there's a lot of um, the whole opioid thing, you know, and people get all mad and it's taken away and, and, and that idea of self-efficacy, that's that one thing they felt like they could control, like that was their control. But I think it's unfair to the rest of the world if people are so pro-opioid for themselves, because that's the only thing they felt like to help them. It's unfair to the rest of the world to not allow them the opportunity to have a risk-free, essentially, and inexpensive or free, you know, just free and low risk. Mm -hmm. it's, it's wrong for people to not allow that opportunity for people to recognize that other things can help them because there are people that do get better and feel better, including myself without the opioids. So I, I just have to make that statement because there's always going to be someone watching that is that they do feel like the opioids help them and they're going to be fighting for that. But we had to fight for all the other things that other people have proven or feel like have helped them as well and happen to be lo less risk than opioids and have brought their life back to them. So that was a pretty strong statement there, but I, I just feel like it's good to know where we're coming from. <laughs> well, I, I, and I, I, I hate talking opioids because I think once yeah. you, once you say the word, Very emotional. you can't, it's like politics. It's like you, you, you yeah. will not have a, you cannot have a rational discussion anymore. Right. Um, it all becomes beliefs and feelings and anecdote and um, and there's a time and place for that stuff, but it doesn't come into a healthcare discussion for in my in my boat. Right. Um, but but just to just to touch on that, wouldn't it be nice if we kind of think about that circle of control? If we can develop a tool set that that you have control over that you can do for yourself anytime anywhere with anyone wouldn't that be nice to have whether or not you're using anything else isn't that wouldn't that be wonderful um that you don't have to wait for a doctor's office or you don't have to you know sign a, a freaking contract which is the stupidest thing ever um <laughs> you know pee in bottles uh yeah. wouldn't it be nice to have something else yeah. um you know and and I think it would be, you know, but right. I don't know. Anyway, we'll, we'll talk, we'll talk about that, all that other stuff. This is, uh, got a little bit longer than I anticipated, but this yeah, was well, this be part one and part two. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, this is definitely part one. And, uh, you want to, you want to, I, I gave the intro. So why don't you give the outro though? Sure. Well, you know, with our idea of having this podcast, um, together, uh, we hope that you, you see the, 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 the passion and the mission behind this to really empower people to see uh, the various things in healthcare, especially in the pain world, you know, pain, we say pain Dora, um, at least this is our, our trial at, at pain Dora's pod podcast, because there's so many things that relate back to pain and everyone wants to have a joyful life. We don't want to have, you know, the pain that, you know, we want pain out of our life, but we know we have to have it to a certain extent. So um, being that life can be stressful or challenging or painful at times, we just want to bring you a perspective that helps you approach it in a way that makes you feel empowered and, and also can help those around you that maybe don't see it the way that um, we hope that they change their minds and, and help themselves instead of relying on the medical system so much. And it's only helping people to help themselves. And um, you just kind of reminded me of the story of Pandora, right? So Pandora, like Pandora's box, we're going to be open this stuff. And if you've ever read the original Greek mythology, when when, pa when uh, Pandora opened the box and all these furies were unleashed on the world, but the last thing that was released was hope. And really with this podcast, maybe we can provide some hope for some people. So I guess that's a good way. Yeah. I love we, it. So. 
Well, it, it was always a pleasure to talk to you, Dr. Katie, and thank you for joining me today. Ditto. So are we going to call you Dr. Kevin or Dr. Kukaro? Or... You know, I'll just go with Dr. Kevin because Kukaro, <laughs> it just gets too hard. It's, well, you get Dr. Kevin, Dr. K is way easier. So. Well, that works. So well, everyone always messes up my last name. They say Caddy, but it's Katie. So we'll, we'll stick with Katie. That'll work. Dr. Katie. Well, that's easier to say than Melissa. I think there, yeah, is there too many syllables. Yeah, you know, there are two Kevin syllables. Katie. There, there you go. go. There you go. <laughs> so, all right, everybody out there, thank you for joining us for the first episode of the Pain Door Podcast. And until next time, stay well. Bye.